What you are about to witness has been described as one of the greatest personal quarrels in the history of science. It is not just a story of a scientist being robbed of the Nobel Prize, but instead of science being robbed of another 30 or 40 years of research presence. Welcome to Science Saturdays, an all-new podcast series that dives into the awe-inspiring lives of researchers whose scientific contributions broke all barriers and transformed the way we understand the universe. My name is Shomajit and in this episode I will give you a sneak peek into Rosalind Franklin's life. To be more precise, you will hear a story of a photograph she took that changed the world as we know it. We travel back to the early 1900s. The world is recuperating from the greatest war of men, yet somehow gearing up for another world war at the horizon. Rosalind Franklin was a child of such times. Born in 1920 London, she was poised to be an excellent scholar, apart from being fluent in multiple languages. Throughout the 1930s, Hitler's persecution of the Jews increased. Rosalind came from an orthodox Jewish family with a strong liberal tradition. Rosalind's father was a political liberal who devoted time, money and energy to an extensive range of charitable schemes throughout his life. The Franklins spent most of their time working with refugee committee on the pleas of the oppressed. Despite excelling in academic curriculum, Rosalind always set the highest standards for herself. This was evident when she failed to attend first class in her undergraduate studies, probably due to the unorthodox and original answers that did not come out well with the examiners. She was devastated at her first academic failure, but moved on to become one of the era's well-known researchers. In the next segment of the podcast, we will witness a rise in the field of chemistry. Rosalind went to Cambridge in 1938 and studied chemistry within the natural sciences, and soon she joined Ronald George Norrish to work on gas phase chromatography. During the war years, however, she was later appointed as a researcher in Paris. Rosalind spent four years in Paris, living for the most part in a cramped quarter. This single room made a strange contrast to the spacious, double-fronted house where she had been brought up. Surprisingly, the cracked flat did not diminish her hopes, instead augmented her personal development. Paris for Rosalind had been a very happy and productive period. However, she knew that to further her career, she must extend her area of research. She was appointed by Sir John Randall at the King's College London. Morris Wilkins was the second in command in the laboratory and was already working on a DNA structure. Raymond Gosling, a PhD student, was appointed to work with Rosalind on her project. She primarily worked on X-ray crystallography, a field that had ventured into biology from the conventional areas of metallurgy and mineralogy. There were many advances to discover the secret of life, and DNA turned out to be a potential candidate. The problem was, nobody knew how DNA looked like, and the structure of DNA was still shrouded in mystery. The following segment unveils the discovery of the much coveted structure of DNA. Rosalind and Gosling single-handedly assembled and fine-tuned the crystallography machine and with the excellent skills of sample preparation, they started imaging strands of DNA. The images she obtained quite 
clearly revealed some of the most essential features of the DNA structure. Although at this stage, the connection between DNA and heredity was only a theory lacking any form of proof, it appeared that determining the actual structure of DNA molecule would be fundamental. It was during this time, two young scientists at Cambridge were trying to model the DNA structure. They assembled different pieces of information from the other research groups. Using cardboard cutouts of the molecules that made up the DNA, they were literally trying to fit the pieces of puzzles to form a DNA structure. They faltered, made mistakes, but never gave up. The world now knows them as James Watson and Francis Crick. At King's College, Rosalind was getting very close. Rosalind's draft paper on 17 March 1953 outlined all the parameters of the helical backbone. She was the one who figured out that there were two forms of DNA. DNA A form and DNA B form which made solving the whole structure possible. She had figured out the backbone of the A form is antiparallel. It wouldn't have been very long before she figured out that the B form backbone was antiparallel as well. The other thing was base pairing, which was Watson's brilliant idea, made possible by Jerry Donahue's chemical information. But if you look at her notebooks, Rosalind was aware of hydrogen bonding as well. All this came from the legendary X-ray photo she took of DNA, now known as Photo 51. During the first two months of 1953, the base heated up. Watson, afraid their competitor Linus Pauling was close to discovering the structure of DNA, decided to travel post haste to King's to consult his old friend Morris Wilkins. What exactly happened is not entirely clear, but apparently Watson and Rosalind almost came to blows before Wilkins arrived and took Watson away. It was then that Wilkins, in good faith, showed Watson the photo that Rosalind had taken. She gave it to him for his own personal use and did not expect that he would hand it over to those in opposition. It was particularly destructive as Rosalind did not even know that it had happened. This was the photo 51 we were talking about. After Watson saw photo 51, he went out to dinner with Wilkins and pressed him for his interpretation, the 34 angstrom measurements and so on. In that early date, Watson didn't know how to interpret a diffraction photo other than the X in the photo meant helix. In terms of getting measurements out of it, he had not the foggiest idea at that point. It was Wilkins who told him how to interpret it. It is uncertain how long it took for Gosling to inform Rosalind of the incident. Still, her original 17 March BDNA manuscript does not reflect any knowledge of the Cambridge model. Rosalind did modify this draft later before publishing it as a third in a trio of 1953 Nature articles. As an experimental scientist, Rosalind seems to have been interested in producing far greater evidence before publishing as proven a proposed model. Accordingly, her response to Watson Creek model was in keeping with her cautious approach to science. But by this time, Watson and Crick had already reached the same conclusion and were all ready to publish. Watson and Crick had set out to discover the secret of life using the technique of model building, while Rosalind's approach was based on her X-ray diffraction patterns of both the A and B form of sodium salt of DNA. The next segment entails the pomp and grandeur that came along the discovery of the structure of DNA. In 1962, the Nobel Prize for Medicine 
or physiology was awarded to Francis H. C. Crick, James D. Watson and Moritz H. F. Wilkins. Almost a decade earlier, the three men had worked together merging data from chemistry, physics and biology to solve the structure of DNA. Crick and Watson built a hypothetical model that would confirm in all its parts to that of Wilkins' X-ray pictures had already shown of the molecule. Some argue that Rosalind Franklin did not receive due recognition for her work and played a more significant role in the discovery than is often acknowledged. When a structure of deoxyribose nucleic acid appeared in nature, Rosalind herself was not aware of how much her research had contributed to the Watson and Crick's discovery. Indeed, they did not widely become clear until Watson published his book called The Double Helix, at which point she had passed away. Thereafter, her role in discovering DNA structure gradually gained wider recognition, raising questions about whether she was not properly credited. And Franklin eventually became a symbol of sexism in science. Rosalind, on the other hand, had decided to transfer to Brickbeck College by 1953. On her arrival at Brickbeck, Rosalind continued working on the tobacco mosaic virus that Bernal had started in 1935. Perhaps, as this was the cramped conditions in the Paris flat, the physical conditions did not bother her as she was at peace with her work, colleagues and herself. Rosalind oversaw a team working on the tobacco mosaic virus and her enthusiasm was a strong influence on those working with her. Her four and a half years at Birbeck saw 17 papers, including three published after her death. This would be a remarkable achievement under the best of circumstances and was astounding when one realizes that she was seriously ill for much of the time and was very well aware of the prognosis of an inoperable cancer. Rosalind's exemplary courage and integrity were apparent to all when, knowing she was mortally ill, she did not complain, but continued working until a few weeks before her death. It must have been during the summer of 1957, when she already knew that she was terminally ill. She accompanied her friend Annie and her children to River Picnic on the Thames. She brought ice cream on dry ice. The kids were all fascinated as she threw out the dry ice and they watched with awe as it zoomed about, apparently steaming around on the surface of the water. The inclusion of dry ice in the picnic basket demonstrated her kindness and thoughtfulness for others, especially children. She shared the children's delight as the ice was about. As Michael G. Gibbons writes in his paper of reassessing discovery, quote, the issue of how much credit Franklin deserves for the discovery of the structure of DNA raises interesting philosophical questions about the nature of discovery." End quote. We end this segment by repeating a quote from Rosalind Franklin herself. Quote, Science, for me, gives the partial explanation for life. In so far as it goes, it is based on fact, experience and experiment. End quote. Thank you for stopping by and sticking to the end of the story and we hope to be with you in the next episode of Science Saturday where we discuss the life of a polymath and a philosopher whose works made others refer to him as the Newton.